recording today. I hope I'm recording that to the right place because I recorded it to the cloud last time and I didn't mean to do that. Uh, but today is June the 14th. It is Tuesday. Um, and today we are going to circle back to at least a topic that I forgot. Well, we didn't really have a lot of time to cover it in full last time. We did briefly talk about classification as a pattern of development. Uh, in addition to those other two ways of developing content, which were description and narration. So we'll start today off uh, going back to classification, talking about that. And then we're making kind of a hard pivot into this week, talking about kind of all things research and writing structure. Um, today, I have some assignments to introduce. Uh, I have the crap analysis worksheets, which I if you've looked ahead on the, the research assignments a little bit, I have tinkered a little bit with the crap analysis worksheet today. Um, so if you looked at it before, it's not like totally different, but there's a couple of little changes I made to it, but I'll go over that today. Uh, and we'll go over the second half of that uh, research PowerPoint that I introduced before, which was about evaluating websites. So I saw us in, I got a chance to read through, at least read through everybody's, uh, research free writing. Uh, I will over the next few days be going in and giving you a little bit more directed feedback, but I, I thought the ones that I read over today were great. Um, they A lot of them are really focused and very specific, and I thought that was really, really cool. And some of them reflect actually having done a little bit of research yourself. Uh, some reflect your professional expertise in particular fields. Um, I've, I've always got somebody writing about oral health. I feel like I have the best teeth in the English department because there's at least one student every semester does a research paper on why my oral health is important to my overall health. So keep those coming uh, for sure. Um, and you know, some were a little bit less specific, some were a little bit more general, a little bit more vague around the edges, but that's fine. Uh, you know, that's what this assignment's for is to do some active brainstorming, sort of get us in the mode of thinking ahead towards what we're going to develop. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the crap analysis in relation to looking at some sources to uh, sort of draw out more ideas on your research project. And I'll introduce the research proposal assignment, uh, which is your first really formal writing assignment. Uh, the research proposal is going to be eligible for revision. It's a formal writing assignment, right? So it's no longer free writing. It's going to be, I'm going to be looking at things like your grammar and your sentence structure. I'm going to be looking a little bit more at the paragraph structure that you give me, um, how the ideas hang together, that sort of thing, and uh, some introductory MLA concepts. And those are some ideas that we're going to touch on today. I'm going to introduce MLA style uh, and some essay writing concepts. And I've got a couple of student models uh, that model some things pretty well and model some things not so well. Um, so that you can compare and contrast uh, something, some instances of writing that I think, you know, are not so great and need improvement or, and better instances of similar things being done in different essays. And I'll get to show you a little bit of like what a work cited page actually looks like, uh, what students, produce in their their actual uh, work cited pages and uh, I'll definitely show you where to find some important information on like the ACC MLA documentation website. Um, and that deeper dive that they go into on the Purdue OWL which again it's just got one of the utilities of the OWL a lots of models lots of this is what this looks like this is what this kind of source looks like which really even in the MLA handbook there's a lot of models but you know, sometimes I find myself like flipping around in the MLA handbook, even as somebody who's been with the MLA forever, and I just go to the Purdue out because I can just like find an example of what I'm looking for just easier on that website. So um, if I'm using it, it's probably going to help you out. Um, and then it's like some general essay ideas. We'll talk about essay structure, uh, the classic five paragraph essay of which is basically kind of what I'm looking for in your final research draft. The proposal kind of has its own structure, uh, but we'll, I'll introduce the idea of a uh, pie paragraph structure, which is uh, definitely an idea that you can at least bring to bear on your research proposal. Um, we won't get to, we probably won't have enough time to talk about persuasive writing today. So uh, we will definitely have time on Thursday to talk about persuasive writing and evaluation as a pattern of development and those two readings. 
uh, that I talked about last week, the Brooks reading and the Beckham reading. Um, if some of you read those already, great. Uh, maybe just refresh your ideas on some of the main points before we talk next time, but I'll use those to model some concepts that probably I'll bring up today, but mostly that I'll be talking about on Thursday, uh, when also I have some more notes about summary uh, and some very, 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 very brief dipping your toe into the shallow end of logic notes. Um, it's not a logic class, so we're not going to get too heavily into it. And I'm actually much more concerned with like fallacies that we're going to spend a lot more time with, like cognitive errors in argument uh, that I think are a little bit more of a fruitful way to introduce the uh, some of the ideas of logic and sort of like backdoor those ideas than it is to like pretend like we're in a logic class. Logic is its own beast. Um, and I recommend it. It's fun, but it's a different department also. <laughs> All right, uh, and before I launch into anything, any comments, questions, concerns, does that all seem pretty straightforward? Great, fantastic. Um, oh, there was one note uh, about the research paper. It was, Karen, you uh, did not decide to write about uh, uh, Malaysia Flight 370, but I gotta tell you, I wanna know what happened to that plane too. Um, it was just something that you had mentioned in your list uh, and you didn't really mention it again, but I was like, I read that and I was like, that's funny. I haven't seen a student that before that like has mentioned that. And I'm like, yeah, I really want to know what happened to that plane. Um, years and years later, I think, what did they found like a row of seats somewhere in Australia? It's wild. Um, so that said, I'll go ahead and share my screen and the first thing we'll do is we'll talk about classification there we go get my gallery up there all right so the main idea is that we're going to talk about uh, under classification, what is classification, what is a category. We're going to talk a little bit about compare and contrast as a way of developing content, a really useful way. Um, almost everything you can develop as a method of comparison and contrast. The idea of definition and some associated ideas of like the difference between a simple definition, which you'll use to some extent, and an extended definition, where an extended definition could be the focus of your entire paper could be an extended definition. Whereas a simple definition is a little bit more, it's a little bit more utilitarian. It's a little bit more pragmatic or useful. Like I, I need to define a word quickly that maybe my readers are unfamiliar with is a simple definition. As opposed to, I am arguing, like my essay is about the definition of freedom itself, which it could be an entire volume of books, um, not just like a paragraph or a single essay. Um, so we'll talk about uh, the differences between those two things. Uh, so what is classification? Uh, first thing to know when you're talking about classification is what is a category? Uh, and a category is a fundamental class or division based on some principle to which things belong. And you'll see that kind of idea I'll come back to over and over again with classification is there is a principle that separates things. And it's very similar to division in that way. And you'll see as we go through that like, Every act of classification is sort of goes hand in hand with an act of division because you're dividing something into smaller parts. But whereas division concentrates on, I'm going to talk about the relationships of these parts, classification might just talk about one of those things that it's dividing into. Or it might talk about like the, there might make a, a longer meditation on the criterion, which is enabling the division itself rather than the things that have been divided out. And I'll try to distinguish those things a little bit more clearly. Uh, classification itself is the action of arranging or organizing things of some type into categories. And this itself is an act of classification. Uh, I have divided classification into three different kinds, right? There's definitions, comparison and contrasting, and formal classification, right? It's an act of division because I'm dividing it into smaller subtypes, but it's an act of, there's a, each of these is a different category, which belongs to the larger idea of what is classification. Uh, so what is formal classification? It arranges information by establishing criteria for a category and filing members into categories based on shared criteria. This is like database stuff, right? Uh, there are certain rules by which things get put into different boxes uh, than other rules. Um, does anybody have Apple TV? I swear this matters. 
No. Uh, watch a show called Severance. It's all about classifying numbers. Um, it stars Adam Scott, previously of he was the really annoying demon in The Good Place, not Ted Danson, but the other one. Um, and he was also Amy Puller's boyfriend on Parks and Rec. He's fantastic. He's the guy that created the Cones of Dunshire. Um, but it, the series is created by Ben Stiller, and it's bitterly dark and sar sarcastic and ironic and just a real interesting backdrop of like corporate workplace stuff. Uh, but it, it, what they all do, their whole job is like classifying numbers based on some vague criteria. Um, that's really all I could say about it. Their work is mysterious and important. Um, but formal classification is like division, but like I said, the focus is different. In division, we separate uh, a category of similar things into smaller sets, whereas in classification, we develop criteria for categories based on the relationship between the items. And so I've got a, a sort of a, a visual representation of that, right? I can divide the, the larger category of energy sources into types of energy sources, right? Depending on what you believe about nuclear, it can be its own category, which at this point, I'm kind of comfortable making just nuclear its own thing. Um, or a lot of people would roll it into alternative energy. Um, you know, maybe maybe the thrust of a paper about energy sources would make an argument for why we need to include or exclude uh, nuclear from this category of alternative energy, depending on how we're defining this category of alternative energy. And then other things are just carbon based energy, right? These are like natural gas, uh, petroleum, coal. I think that's all the only three that go in that category. And then, you know, other things that are not nuclear or carbon based. These are things like solar, tidal, all different kinds of water power, right? It could be uh, hydroelectric. Geothermal is, it's not really tidal, but it has to do with like hot springs. Um, it's a little bit different than like dams or even uh, like tidal power, which is like using ocean tides to create, uh, to turn turbines and stuff like that. Uh, or solar, obviously, the different kinds of solar. There's photovalic, uh, which those little panels. Uh, there's the big mirrors that focus light on a point and just make something real hot and turn uh, heat into steam, which turns a turbine. It's all, it's all a system of pulleys and tubes. It's all about turning turbines, right? Um, most of the time. Fission, I don't think, is about turning turbines, but that's part of nuclear that we haven't explored yet. Uh, but right, so I've got like a criteria. What is an energy source? And I would develop some definition and then I would classify by an act of division into these three. And I could concentrate on any one of these, right? And that's kind of like where the difference between developing a classification paper and a division strategy goes. It's like division is going to maybe look at how all of these are related, whereas classification might just mention that there are different categories and focus on you know, one of these subcategories. Uh, so strategies for formal classification, what kinds of your topics are there, right? Often list making helps here. And again, this is very much like database organizing kinds of stuff. It's very like rigid categories, categories having like very set definitions. Things are very clearly included and excluded a lot of the time. Uh, what principle of classification accounts for how you generate your categories? Uh, if you've generated more than five, which is kind of arbitrary, how could you limit the number? The idea of classification is like you want to generate like a small set of things under which you can then organize other stuff, right? If your process of classification has generated 15 categories, maybe you need 15 categories, but maybe, maybe there's a, another more simplified way that you can organize that data, right? It's all about how, what, what efficient ideas can I file all of these little pieces under? Um, what details will you include in each category? What other patterns of organization will you use to develop the categories, right? And so classification is just sort of oftentimes this initial strategy, which is really often compare, uh, developed through this idea of comparison and contrast. Uh, which is a method of demonstrating similarities and differences between things. And I think we're all pretty familiar with comparison contrast. It's kind of like the pattern of development. And I think that's drilled into uh, any kind of writing instruction, maybe more than anything else. Uh, take one thing, compare it to something else, right? It's the, 
it's where the rubber meets the road with like kind of all figurative language. It's all similes and metaphors and analogies. It's all comparison thinking. It's how is this thing unique and how does it compare with these other things? Um, it's the same thing with classification and division, right? Like making this act of definition and then which is an act of separation of, you know, an idea or a concept from other ideas and concepts and, and highlighting, you know, what are those essential things that make this the thing it is, right? And which we talked about a little bit with physical description, right? What are those unique characteristics that make the thing itself? Um, so there's like kind of two ways that you can proceed with uh, comparison and contrast. And it's the idea of comparing and contrasting uh, kind of everything at the same time or do, uh, what we call separation of detail or alternation of detail. And so separation of detail considers all the points of similarity and all the points of differences in like separate sections, right? So like maybe you take a paragraph and you're gonna say, uh, I have, you know, I have cup and uh, I have cup and water bottle. I will compare all of the similarities in one part. And now in another part, I'm gonna compare all the differences, right? All the similarities are, they hold volumes of liquid. They are relatively portable. They are, I think that might be where the similarities end. Uh, they are aesthetically pleasing. I don't know, that's kind of subjective. Uh, the difference is this one is made of glass. This one is made of uh, plastic. Uh, this one is probably better at holding hot liquids because it's a little bit more insulated. This one, probably not so great at holding hot liquids, probably only a cold liquid holding device, right? And so I could compare those things in the same at the same time, right? I could talk about all the similarities at once and then switch directions and talk about all the differences at once. Or I could do alternation of detail and I could go point by point, right? Maybe I have a, a paragraph dedicated to uh, the ways that these hold liquid compared, right? Uh, a fascinating paragraph uh, at a blistering speed, I'm sure. And even within that paragraph, I could use different strategies of like, you know, maybe a little bit of narrative. Um, maybe if I'm like introducing an anecdote, but definitely physical description would be another way that sort of is a hollow, right? As opposed to, are there any, are there any solid liquid carrying devices? That was just for when you were suggesting similarity between the mm. two. Okay, no, yeah, yeah, definitely. Both of them are hollow, right? Um, and yeah, it's just another another thing that we could file. And you know, if I was, this is also a good way of thinking of like your outlining process. Outlining of a comparison and contrast is a really good way of organizing. You know, what am I going to say about these things, or what am I going to say about this thing, right? What are the, you know, what categories am I dividing this out to? Uh, and you know, how am I, com you know, comparing things? You know, am I going to do I want to list all the similarities of this thing to something very similar to it in one paragraph, or do I want to sort of go point by point on how they do a similar thing differently, right? I could have like a paragraph about uh, holding liquids. One of them holds hot liquids. And why does it hold hot liquids? Yeah, it's because it's made of glass. The glass is a little bit better at insulating and keeping heat. But the other one is a little bit thinner material and it's plastic and, you know, heat would, oh, now nah, I don't even want to say what heat would do because anybody who knows anything about physics would immediately know that I don't know what I'm talking about. Something about losing heat fast in plastic. Um, and I'll just leave it there. Uh, but I think you get the point here, right? Uh, you know, strategies for developing comparison and contrast. How are two things similar? How are they different? What details should be included? Uh, you know, it's a question that keeps coming back to. What should we talk about? What is the scope of the thing we're talking about, right? It's a question that comes up with physical description. You know, what are its essential characteristics? What can I, you know, ignore talking about uh, to focus on something more important, right? With narration, it's, you know, I can't, tell you the whole story. So I'm going to whittle it down to what are the most essential cause and effect relationships that I can talk about. Uh, in comparison, contrast, like what, what important points of comparison are going to be included, right? One, one difference between, say, these two liquid receptacles, uh, one is covered in stickers, one is not. That's not particularly important, I think, to discussing like maybe the overall purpose of these two things or how well they accomplish the thing that they're designed to do. Uh, I could just as easily put stickers on this. That would be kind of weird to me, honestly. I don't know anybody who puts stickers on their glass mugs, but you could do it. Uh, I won't put you in jail. I'm not going to call the sticker police on you. Um, you know, how do these details, uh, how do they, oh, words are hard. How should the details be arranged? Uh, separation or alternation of detail, right? And this is sort of starting to ask ourselves a structural question. How do we organize the content 
that we're writing, right? Uh, not just at a paragraph level, but how do we organize those paragraphs? In what order do we want to present information to our reader? Uh, so what is definition? Definition is an act of expressing, explaining, or otherwise assigning meaning to a word or phrase. Um, we talked about definition a little bit. We talked about self-definition, right? What is an important value to you and why is that important? And it's that why is this important is kind of like ascribing meaning to yourself, right? It's a self-referential kind of definition. Um, when we define, we often use strategies of classification and division, but some definitions can also use argument. Uh, you can use a little bit of everything. You can uh, use an illustrative narrative to define something. Uh, you definitely could use descriptive language to define something. Um, and again, like, uh, you know, the point of a whole argument could be arguing that a specific idea or word should be or should not be understood in a certain way. Right? Um, so when writing a definition, your goal is to help the reader understand a concept or a new term or come to some new understanding of an existing term or concept. Like I said, some definitions can be simple, some can be complex. Like, uh, you know, sometimes you're introducing a, a totally new word. Um, that hasn't been defined yet, right? All words are made up eventually. Uh, so, you know, at some point we've ascribed meaning to a word for the first time. Um, and words have meanings before we even had dictionaries. A dictionary is a relatively, you know, in the scope of things, a pretty recent innovation. I think the first English language dictionaries rolled out in England in something like the early 1600s. And they weren't very extensive. They were just like what were called hard words lists. Um, but we didn't get the really extensive dictionary like we would uh, know a dictionary today until Samuel Johnson, and that was like 1790, something like that. Uh, the United States is older than the dictionary, uh, which is kind of wild to think about, <laughs> um, or at least in the English language. There are probably older dictionaries in other languages. I'm not actually not familiar with uh, the non-Anglo defining words world, but at least for the English language, our sense of English dictionaries don't go back that far. Uh, so we've relied on pretty simple definitions for most of the time. Uh, and we'll talk about you know, the most simple kind of definitions, literally just pointing at something. Right? Somebody asks, what is a water bottle? And you say, water bottle. Right? Um, this is, it's got a formal word. right? This is a definition by ostentation. Uh, I'm trying to learn Spanish terribly with Duolingo right now. And I've, I've instructed Adriana, one of my coworkers, I'm like, as much as you can, only talk to me in Spanish. And she will rattle off a whole thing. And I just, I, I just my face is a question mark. And so she does lots of pointing, right? She does lots of learning a new language is a lot of definition by ostentation. Este. Like, okay, thank you. Gracias. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of like trial and error with the most simplest kind of definitions. But obviously in your writing, you're not going to be doing a lot of definition by ostentation. If you can somehow figure out a way to do definition by ostentation in your writing, I will be impressed. Um, you'll have to like, I don't know, send me like a, a you have to draw me a picture or something. Um, the formal definitions, these sometimes these are called lexical definitions. These are like dictionary definitions. They're the they're the kind of the gold standard generic kind of definition. And importantly, dictionaries are useful to define words and it might be useful to define less common words for your audience. But in general, you don't really quote the dictionary unless you're doing like some kind of etymological paper, right? Maybe you're writing a paper about the history of a specific word, um, which has, you know, the, which is called doing an etymology. Uh, it's a study of a word's origins. Uh, you know, in that case, you might cite some different dictionaries that maybe have defined the word a little bit differently. Maybe the word used to mean something and its meaning has changed over time. But in general, if like you in your beginning of your essay, what sometimes I'll see is students will be like, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, food is the thing which humans eat for sustenance. And I'm like, I, you know, we don't need that. <laughs> as long as you're appealing to the common definition of words, we don't really need to appeal to the dictionary, right? You're just using the words as if they were defined. But if you're using a word in a special context or you're using a special meaning of a word, maybe you're maybe you want to appeal to a specialized dictionary, like a medical dictionary or something like that, which maybe has a commonly used word, but in a very specific context, uh, then you might want to take a moment and defer to a dictionary definition. Um, especially if, 
you know, you're writing to uh, a uh, you know, an audience that is outside the field that you're using the word with. Uh, but simple definitions, these are the ones that you're probably going to work with more often. Um, these just use specific examples or comparisons to define words. So there's a bunch of different types of these. Uh, you can define by synonym or antonym. You can uh, do what's called enumerative definitions, definition by subclass, uh, and then definition by genus and difference. And this is probably the most robust of the simple definitions. Um, a definition by synonym or antonym is exactly what it sounds like. This word is like this word. This word is not like this word, right? Um, these are really useful, but they... General question, um, what, what could be a problem in defining a word with a synonym for your audience? If, you were, if I were to tell you, now this is one of my examples I just meant, uh, freedom means liberty. What could possibly be a problem with that kind of definition with your audience? It can sound redundant. It can sound redundant, right? Um, you know, strictly speaking, freedom does mean liberty. It is circular. Um, exactly, Deborah. It might not be clear enough, right? If I don't know also the definition of liberty, then I don't know that it's redundant, right? I don't, I, I, I don't know that those two things are maybe synonyms. So, you know, maybe in a lot of ways, you know, synonyms can clarify meaning, but maybe it won't clarify it enough. Maybe it's still vague if your audience is unfamiliar with the term that you're defining it in relation to. Uh, same thing with a, a similar thing occurs with the definition by antonym, where um, you're not really saying anything positive about the word, what it is, by saying what it's not. Right? It might be useful to you know enumerate, illuminate its relationship with uh, negative concepts, but it doesn't really maybe not say a whole lot. Right? Freedom means liberty. Freedom does not mean oppression. Right? It's like, again, those are pretty circular definitions. Uh, they don't really illuminate a whole lot, right? They're strictly speaking, they're, you know, it is a synonym, but, or an antonym in the case of freedom does not mean oppression. But, you know, the second one, freedom does not mean oppression, doesn't really tell you a whole lot about what freedom is. You know, freedom, you know, it suggests a lot. You know, it suggests that freedom is not being in a state of bondage. Uh, whatever that may mean, maybe literal or metaphorical, right? Uh, maybe freedom means you're not literally under arrest and handcuffs, but, it, you know, maybe it also means you're not in a state of mental bondage of some kind. Maybe you're brainwashed. Maybe you're uh, a member of Charles Manson's cult, um, which was something that I, uh, this is another, does bring me back to another point that somebody had wrote, uh, somebody's writing about serial killers, always a fun topic. Um, Kylie, Charles Manson, fun fact, not technically a serial killer. Um, Charles Manson uh, is more of a cult leader than a serial killer. He definitely, people, he convinced people to kill people, but he himself actually is generally accepted, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I don't think Charles Manson has actually ever been convicted of killing a person. He might have killed at least one person, but he's not actually like a serial killer. He's just like kind of a crazy guy. <laughs> um, and he's just, well, he was dangerous. I'm pretty sure he's dead now. Um, but it was something that's, uh, that's an interesting thing uh, to circle back to just there. But it, it like piqued my interest with the serial killer topic. Um, some more definitions. Definition by enumeration assigns meaning to a word by listing members of the set which belong to the term and definition by subclass assigns meaning to a word by listing subsets of the term. And that's a bunch of abstract, funny language. What does that mean? Well, I think this is pretty illustrative. Uh, a definition by enumeration, a planet means a body like Jupiter, Neptune, Bernard, Star, B, or Earth, right? It's deferring to specific examples of the thing. What is a dog? A dog is a thing like a corgi or, um, or actually, no, that would be the other one. What is a dog? A dog is, a, by enumeration, a dog is a thing like Lottie, who was staying with me last week. Uh, or a dog is like Polly, the dog that played Lassie in the, the famous uh, Lassies. Well, at least one of the Lassie dogs. Spoiler alert, there were a lot of Lassie dogs, unfortunately. Um, it went on for a long time. Dogs don't look that long. Uh, but it, right, uh, definition by enumeration, you're enumerate, enumerating specific examples of a thing. Whereas a planet means a gas giant, an ice giant, a super earth or a terrestrial body, right? These aren't 
specific examples. These are general categories of planets, right? Uh, Jupiter is a kind of gas giant. Neptune is a kind of ice giant. Uh, Bernard star B is a type of super Earth, right? Uh, so it's just really the difference between specifics and uh, generalities, right? A definition by enumeration is you're just lifting specific examples of the thing, whereas a definition by subclass, you're listing the, the larger class to which specific things belong to, if that makes any sense. Um, again, these are pretty helpful too. They're very useful, but you know, again, they could not totally illuminate things, right? What does it mean to be a planet? Isn't really totally answered by these things. It's just giving you like some synonyms, right? This is really close to an idea of definition by synonym. It's just telling you stuff that it's like. It's not really exactly elaborate. What is the meaning of this word, right? What is what is what do we mean when people use this word? And that's where we get to a definition by genus and difference. Uh, it assigns meaning to a term by identifying a larger set to which it belongs and an attribute which distinguishes it from among other members of a set. And dictionary definitions oftentimes are sort of built on the engine of the definition by genus of difference. And these are definitions that really start to tell you how, what a thing, what is essentially that thing and how it's different from other stuff, right? Um, and these kinds of definitions are like, you know, skyscraper means very tall building. Right. This is a definition that sort of reduces ambiguity by assigning a very specific meaning to a word. Right. Uh, we might not know what building means. Right. We might need to define some other words here, but it's usually taking a concept and explaining it in terms of smaller, easily to understand concepts. Right. Ice means frozen water. Right. What is the genus? Water. What is the difference? It's frozen. Uh, what is the genus here? Building. What kind of building? It's a tall one. Right. Um, and that's a really useful definition. These are like whenever you're building definitions, especially if you're building them for the first time, these are really pragmatic, useful definitions onto which to build arguments too. And to serve as sort of the basis for some of these extended definitions. Um, these are much more comprehensive and exhaustive. They really elaborate on the meaning of a word. Again, sometimes engaging in argument or narrative. Um, they can offer stipulative definitions, which are you know, when you're defining a word for the first time, when you're offering a theoretical definition, maybe you're taking a, a word or a phrase and you're defining it in a new context. You know, there was a time before Einstein when the words special and relativity didn't mean what they mean together uh, until he like defined a specific concept, right? Now special relativity refers to a whole host of concepts associated with like, quantum physics, you could say. Um, Sometimes you want to throw out definitions that are very extended to uh, offer a very precise definition of a word, right? I keep coming back to the idea of freedom, right? Uh, the Declaration of Independence is, in a way, a precise, it's an argument that is making a very precise definition of what specifically are the conditions under which a political unit severs itself from a larger political unit. Um, or, you know, maybe a persuasive accountable word. Don't think of this word meaning this, think of this word meaning this other thing. Or think of it, you know, maybe you're aiming to change what people's perceptions of a word are, depending on how, like, the context it's been used in. Many words have fallen out of popular use and favor uh, for people offering persuasive accounts of maybe not using specific words in common or polite discourse um, to varying degrees of success. Uh, and so there's a lot of different strategies that we could use for offering extended definitions, uh, offering a, an illustrative narrative, right? You know, uh, you could say that uh, David Sedaris's Us and Them is kind of like an extended narrative on you know, what does it mean to, what does it mean to be different in a way? Um, it's kind of an extended narrative on that, or there, there are some words that are illuminated by the, the arc of his narrative. Um, you could say that, you know, in especially at uh TED Talk, she's offering lots of illustrative narratives to talk about uh, this is the power of stories. This is what stories can do. Stories can produce illumination or stereotypes. Um, and she offers lots of like smaller stories to illustrate that point. Uh, using descriptive energy, showing how it functions in the language, its functionality, show how, how does this, how do we use this word relative to other similar words or ideas. Um, historical context, uh, which is really related to this idea of etymology. Um, and I'll take a brief moment to talk about etymology. Uh, in case you don't know what etymology is, it's a fancy word, like I said, it just means the study of word origins. Um, uh, a common online etymology dictionary I use is the online etymology dictionary. Often like a dictionary definition like Merriam-Webster will give you a short etymology. It'll tell you things like 
you know, let's, let's stick with freedom. Let's go with, right? I want to look up the word freedom. Oh. Um, all right, it gives us a whole bunch of different definitions. It's got a, a, a couple, like the, a lot of different nuances. Uh, but if you scroll down a little bit, it'll generally tell you first known use of freedom before the 12th century in English um, in the meaning defined in sense one, right? And then it'll give you a history and etymology. See free in tree one. So you'll come up to free and then it'll take you to the etymology of free. It comes from Middle English. Uh, which is the, the middle state of the English language that existed in like uh, you know, Chaucer's time is the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. Uh, and it comes from the old English word Freau, which is like the old high German Frei, uh, which is also similar to the Welsh. I can't even begin to pronounce Welsh. Um, uh, but also it's related to the Sanskrit word, which Sanskrit's a, an ancient language of like Central Asia and India. Um, so it has this relation to all these older languages too. So it gives you like kind of a, a very brief overview of like where the word came from and maybe what it meant in its original context. But if you go to a, an actual etymology dictionary, uh, it's gonna give you a much more comprehensive idea of what this word means of where it came from and how it relates to other linguistic parts. Uh, it's from the old English freedom, uh, which means power of self-determination, state of free will, emancipation from slavery and deliverance, which is interesting. So it's a, maybe a sort of a, a religious connotation. Uh, right, but Rebecca, you're exactly right. It, it, go, it, it tells you the, the roots of the word uh, and how that word relates to other related concepts, right? Uh, so we know that freedom is actually a compound particle uh, created uh, by taking the base word free, which is an adjective and end, uh, putting dom on the end of it. We put dom on the end of all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, freedom, kingdom, um, I can't think of anything else right now. Um, for some reason I can't think of anything else that ends in dom. Uh, boredom, uh, Christendom, dukedom, um, catdom, I don't know about all that, chiefdom, a lot of these are pretty, some of these are not very nice, uh, but a lot of them are overtly political, uh, some of them are scathingly uh, terrible, but uh, it comes from the old English doom, uh, which does not necessarily mean uh, a terrible time had by all, doom means uh, a statute or a law, uh, in particular doom means like something like uh, justice yeah judgment um anyway so it's like some sort of political word but you can go to the word free and i can see oh okay it's actually related to something called uh the proto-indo-european root pri uh and you can see all kinds of words that it's related to in other languages anyway it tells you like it, it puts the word in its sort of worldly context uh which are really really interesting sometimes it's illuminating to do that sometimes it's just interesting uh, but you know if you're tracing you know if your argument may rest on how a word's use has changed over time it might be useful to defer to its etymology that might be useful in that context um so questions comments concerns everybody maybe get the upshot of what's going on with classification. So it's like the, the idea that we're going for with classification is, you know, how is it, how are you ordering information again, right? It's all about ordering information, but it's about really comparison and contrast. It's about identifying those essential characteristics, comparing it to things that it's like, uh, highlighting those salient characteristics itself, and then offering, you know, an extended definition of, uh, of the thing. What is it? What does it mean? Again, really similar to sort of mixing strategies of division and description at the same time, right? But also maybe going like a little hand in hand with something like uh, narrative. Uh, what I will do now, got about eight minutes left until a break. That's a pretty natural stopping point. Let's take a break there. Um, let's take 10 and we'll come back at, we'll call it six. 55. We'll take 12. Um, okay, not a problem, Abby. Um, we'll take we'll take till six or yeah, six fifty-five, and then we'll pick back up and we'll start by talking about the next set of research assignments and then pivot to a discussion about you know some fundamentals of MLA style and 
We might not get to everything with uh, essay writing, but we'll at least be looking at some student examples of essay writing. So I was like, try to weave in some of those topics uh, as we go along today. And what we don't finish up today, we'll, we'll touch on next time. So y'all go ahead and take some time and I'll see y'all back in just a minute.
Okay, welcome back. So I will go ahead and share this. All right. Oh, let me mute you there. Um, unless did I uh, unnecessarily mute you, Kat? Did you have a question? No, no, I didn't. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, great. Uh, so when we last left our uh, fantastic research uh, PowerPoint PDF, uh, we had made it all the way to right before the crap test. Um, the last thing, the last time we saw this uh, set of slides, we had ended on a brief guide to top level domains, just kind of distinguish the different types of websites there are, uh, and uh, a, little, a short discussion about what kind of information that those websites host, uh, and also all of those terrifying other top level domains that are not covered by these things like .io, .ninja, .peanut butter sandwich, or whatever may have you out there um, that are probably not hosting the most credible information. Um, but now I want to turn to something specific called the crack test, which is a method that you can apply to websites in order to gauge or evaluate or help you develop a sense of criteria that's going to uh, point you towards the idea of whether or not this information is useful, is it valid, is it credible, is it uh, authentic. Um, and CRAP stands for Currency, Relevance, Authority, Accuracy, and Purpose. It's uh, five different areas that you can analyze to sort of aggregate an evaluation. Uh, and you know, like I said, develop criteria for encountering information. Uh, so currency, the C, the timeliness of the information. And these are all just going to be a set of questions that you can ask yourself as you encounter content. Uh, when was the information published or posted? Has the information been revised or updated? Is the information current or out of date? Uh, are the links functional, right? Uh, a lot of these are sort of pragmatic use questions. Um, is anybody paying attention to and maintaining this information? Uh, if the answer is this website hasn't been updated, so, you know, it's an angel fire site from 1993, maybe that information is not being properly maintained in, like, by a custodian. Uh, maybe nobody's updated that in a while. Um, it's not, again, no one of these is a direct uh, catch all for everything, but each one of these questions, you know, the more questions that you are answering negatively, that's another little red flag going up, right? And once you reach sort of a critical mass of red flags, uh, then maybe don't, maybe that is not a great source of information, right? Any one or two of these though, like, you know, you could still generally get, you know, credible information from websites that might raise some concerns, but they might, you know, other websites raise more. Um, relevance, the importance of the information to your needs. Um, this is just like the question of validity, right? Is this even related to what you're saying? Um, it's not terribly often, but sometimes I get um, a source in a research paper and I'll go take a look at the source. And I'm like, this source has absolutely nothing to do with this paper. Like, it's not about the same topic. Um, you know, sometimes maybe it's just like a blog that somebody is like hosting content or they're, they're like, I don't know, like mycrazynonsense.wordpress.com. Uh, and it's, you know, you know it's Chris's, word, Chris's water bottle WordPress site. And it's just all the things that I think about water bottles, right? Um, you know, who am I? And what does my opinion matter about water bottles? My water bottle scholar? Maybe, maybe not, right? Probably not. Um, but mostly it's just a question of whether or not is this information actually pertinent to the thing that you're talking about? Um, you know, does it relate to your topic or the answer to your question? Who is the intended audience of this, right? You know, sometimes I get a link to a source that I'm like, I don't understand how the student understood this information, right? It's maybe it's directed towards a level of sophistication that is very clearly like aimed at somebody who we are not in their intended audience, right? Not saying that you can't use that information, but it might be a little bit more difficult to justify its place in the paper, right? Um, 
and sometimes this is just a question of like, oh, I found one sentence in something that I liked and I just put that sentence in and like, cause I needed a source uh, and they don't really understand the larger context. So, you know, using, using sources that you actually can understand, right? It doesn't make it an uncredible source, but you know, if you can't adequately understand the information, even if it is relevant, you know, practically useless, uh, even if it's not actually useless. Um, have you looked at the variety of sources before determining if this is the best one to use, right? How does it compare to other stuff, right? One of the things I want to underline with this crap test and is that, you know, don't silo yourself on a single website trying to evaluate its credibility. Read laterally, and we'll get to a distinction between reading horizontally and reading vertically. Um, vertically being, you know, physically scrolling up and down on a page, but reading horizontally, like, fact-checking information, using sources like factcheck.org or even Snopes, which you know, I'm not, you know, Snopes is okay. Uh, it's, I, I like factcheck.org better, but you know, all sides or other sorts of media evaluation metrics, you know, what, is, what are there news articles about this website? Uh, in the uh, MLA Guide to Digital Literacy, one of the websites that they feature when they talk about the crap test and reading vertically versus horizontally is a, a website called The Natural News. Uh, which is maintained by Mike, Mike Adams, the health ranger, uh, frequent contributor to InfoWars. Um, I was really shocked to find Mike Adams in my MLA handbook because I knew a little bit about Mike Adams before I ran into him in the media evaluation site. Um, there's articles about the credibility of Mike Adams from other reputable news sources. Um, he does not have a particularly high hit rate uh, in terms of accuracy. Um, he also, had, it's very unclear what Mike Adams's particular credentials even are, uh, or what a health ranger does. Um, I mean, I guess he ranges health. I don't know. Um, I'm not exactly, he's like in the jungles, like fighting in the name of health. I'm not really sure. Uh, but the upshot is that, you know, you can find other information that triangulates that talk about a history of uncredible information being put, uh, forwarded and shared on that side of conspiracy theory, a little bit more than actual information. Um, and would you be comfortable using the source in your research paper, which is really sort of a value subjective judgment on your part, but, you know, given how many red flags you see a particular site raising, you know, do you, would you feel comfortable putting this in a paper that you would maybe submit for, you know, evaluation or publication or something like that, right? Uh, asking yourself first and seeing what your intuition would say. Um, and again, uh, w whenever I get to the actual assignment with this, you know, I'll ask you this question and, I'm not necessarily looking for a positive or negative answer. I'm just kind of looking for what your answer is, right? If you encounter a source and you want to do the crap test on it and you ultimately are like, this is a pretty uncredible source, then that's what I want you to talk, tell me about, right? I'm not looking for you to take uh, you do the crap uh the crap test worksheet on just credible sources, right? As long as it's a source you encounter in your research, that's what I want you to apply this to. And if you encounter a source that you're like, this is absolutely ridiculous. I want to see how ridiculous that is, right? We need data on bad sources too, right? It's not just about finding good information. It's about understanding why some information is good and why some information is bad. And I don't even like to say good and bad. It's just like why some information is credible and what makes other websites incredible. Incredible in a negative way, right? Not incredible like wowza. Uh, incredible like uh, not credible, right? Uncredible. Uh, the authority of the source. Uh, who is this author? Who is the, who's publishing this information, right? Sometimes it's very clear to figure out who the author is. And I mean, it's not a hard and fast ironclad rule, but generally the easier it is to tell who wrote the thing, the more credible, the, at least the more solid ground you can establish about the credibility of the information. If it is very difficult to figure out who wrote something, even the organization that like maintains the website itself, maybe somebody is trying to distance themselves from the veracity of that information. Um, I have a website that I want to sort of run through in just a little bit that uh, it is impossible to figure out who or what wrote the information that was uh, that is on it. Um, you know what uh, what qualifications did the author seem to have about this, right? Some websites are really good about this, like websites like Investopedia. I think Healthline is also like an Investopedia derivative website. Uh, they'll give you like a little. You can click on the author and they'll give you a little biography about who they are um and you know what they write about and sometimes like in the course of the actual text of the article you'll find that out sometimes you can just do a, a google search 
And one of the things I like to do is I will take somebody's name if they have academic credentials. If somebody's like, oh, I got my degree here, I will search for their, uh, uh, their CV, their curriculum vita. Uh, and I, those are, if you work for a university, like you can find my CV with ACC. You can see like where I went to college, what I got my degrees in, what I, what, if anything, I've published. Um, which is a very short CV, um, but I've taught a lot of classes. Uh, I but you'll be able to see, you know, I got my master's degree at Texas State. I got my bachelor's at Texas State. Like you can see on somebody's CV, like where they went, and it, you know, if they, it's another question of whether or not they're it's a fraudulent CV. But you know, if somebody claims to have some kind of doctorate or academic credentials, one of the first things I'll do is I'll just Google their name plus CV, and I'll see what comes back. If they work for a research institution, if they work for a university, it's, you're going to find it. Um, the harder it is to find somebody's academic qualifications, you know. Uh, one of the things that I love running into, I love conspiracy theory world. Like one of my favorite things is learning. Uh, if, if you don't know what Project Camelot is, like I highly recommend figure, uh, finding out a little bit about Carrie Cassidy. Um, not uh, not just for fun, but um, she often has people that she interviews that claim to have like certain academic credentials. And it turns out that the credentials they have aren't an accurate representation of what they actually do. People will claim to be doctors. And if I were to tell you I'm interviewing a doctor, um, you know, I'm having somebody on uh, to talk about whether or not the reptile aliens have released coronavirus on mankind. And I'm going to sit down with Dr. You know, Christopher Morgan. What sort of credentials would you think that Dr. Christopher Morgan might have? Okay, uh, at least like if I'm a doctorate, right, it, it's at least like that's implying some amount of school. You know, if I'm claiming to, you know, if I'm standing here and I'm making claim, and I'm saying I have a doctorate, I'm a doctor, address me as doctor, and I'm making lots of statements about, you know, a, a global virus. What kind of specific degree do you might think I have? Uh, degree in virology. It's right, some specific medical field, epidemiology, virology, some sort of research field. If you find out that I have a doctorate of theology, um, and that would be a little different, right? Um, maybe uh, I'm misrepresenting myself, right? And also, you know, you get a, you go to a long enough, you know, long enough study, you know, you can get a doctorate in anything and you become doctor, right? I could be Dr. Christopher Morgan talking about the coronavirus. I could have a doctorate in technical writing. I could have a PhD in education, right? It doesn't give me any specific credentials to speak about this particular field, but I can wave this banner around and say, I'm a doctor, I'm a doctor. And people use that as a, as a means of sort of shielding in uncredible sources with the sort of the, the thin veneer of credibility, right? This happens all the time in conspiracy world. Um, somebody is a doctor of something or somebody has some specific professional experience that's being actively misrepresented or it's you're not getting all the information that you could have gotten about that individual. And there's a certain sort of misdirection, right? As we talk, uh, we just talked about, right? If I say I'm a doctor and I'm talking about a specific kind of medical issue, there's an unspoken premise that you're connecting in your head that this person must have a doctorate in this, right? But people exploit the idea that, well, I haven't stated what I'm a doctor in to sort of use that ambiguity and use that vagueness to, you know, push whatever their agenda is. They want to sell you, you know, enriched iodine or diet supplements or whatever they happen to be pushing that day. Um, so uh, is there a contact information? Can you readily contact these people who are hosting this content? Uh, does the URL reveal anything relevant about the source of the author, right? This is that top level domain, right? This is a .com, a .edu, .gov, or any one of these other various uh, domains. Uh, the accuracy and reliability and trustworthiness. Uh, you know, where does this information come from, right? Uh, where do they, where does this article claim that they're getting their information from? Like, is there some sort of system of citation uh, apparent, right? Um, is this peer reviewed in some way? Uh, like I said, going back to the Investopedia example, they'll often say, like, there'll often be this sort of like general copywriters who write about topics of investment and finance. And then that is then reviewed by somebody who has maybe an economics degree, right? There's a level of fact checking that has gone into the editorial process. It's not just checking for grammar, it's checking for the accuracy of the quality and the content of the ideas. Um, 
And, uh, you know, is, is there some system of linking, right? Um, in, in academic writing, we use academic styles to indicate where we're getting our information from, right? And that's what we'll talk a little bit about that today when we talk about, you know, what is MLA style? Why do we use in-text citation? What is a works cited list? We're familiar with hyperlinks. It's probably the most readily available means of linking you to information that demonstrates where some source got their information, right? You go on Twitter, somebody's getting into a flame more about some stuff. Sometimes you'll see people linking or like, so like dueling links uh, in the comments, right? And you know, linking is a, is a quick and easy way of saying, you know what, your, inf you know, your information's wrong, go here and read this information, right? Um, sometimes that's useful, sometimes it's not, right? If they're linking it to incredible sources or you know, they're linking to like demonstrably bad information or demonstrably uh, you know, incomplete uh, or out of context or misrepresented information, right? Then, then that's a different question. Uh, but sometimes there will be, you know, systems of footnotes that are in stuff. You know, that's more of a print uh, means of communicating, you know, where information was gotten from. But if you use APA style, I'm pretty sure APA uses footnotes much more extensively than MLA does. Chicago style uses footnotes uh, to source their information in writing or in print or uh, in typing or in print. You know, websites generally don't use a lot of hyperlinking or uh, they don't generally don't use a lot of like uh, footnoting. Uh, but if they do use footnoting, often they'll take advantage of like the digital space and they'll like use hyperlinks as their footnotes and you'll be able to It'll like take you to some part of that same page a little bit lower down on the scroll that like has a list of information where you can get it from. That's one of the benefits of, of Wikipedia that's really useful is that it, you know, it does include references most of the time uh, to varying degrees of success, right? Like some Wikipedias are very extensively footnoted. Some Wikipedias read like academic theses themselves. Some Wikipedias are like, you know, a paragraph that's very badly cited, um, or it'll say you'll see the little citation needed, uh, or you know this this dispute, uh, this claim in dispute. Um, and actually, Wikipedia has this interesting feature. Um, like if you go to any given Wikipedia page, let's go to the Wikipedia page about pronouncing the word GIF. Um, you can see up at the top says article and talk. If you click on talk, this is actually the issues and problems that Wikipedia editors argue about of what should and should not be included on this page, including controversial edits, uh, discussions of like things that should have been uh, taken out or things that need to be put in. Um, often you'll see like if a, if a particular Wikipedia article is like subject to lots of like graffiti or trolling or just like uh, there's a specific word they call it whenever um, uh, a Wikipedia article is like repeatedly um, like updated, like it's like a form of trolling. I can't remember what it's called, um, but you know, vandalize. That's what it is. Uh, if so, like some Wikipedia articles, like uh, you know, the Wikipedia article for the you know, comet ping pong in Washington D.C., the straw a victim of lots of uh, vandalism after the Pizzagate conspiracy. Uh, lots of people trying to go in and add, you know, the location of the basement to comet ping pong. Um, which is a terrible, horrible thing. Um, but there's a lot to a Wikipedia article that is like pretty useful and pretty interesting. And right, you know, there's a lot of references that you can go to. Some of these references, you know, some of these links work. A lot of these links are dead. Um, you know, it just kind of you have to go one by one and find them. Uh, sometimes they even include more extensive, uh, you know, uh, sources or reference material that you can go to. I mean, again, Wikipedia isn't without its uh, uses. But, you know, as a source itself, uh, it does leave a lot to be desired. Oh, one more thing. Uh, are there lots of spelling, grammatical or typological errors? Uh, one way to quickly figure out if somebody is taking their content seriously is if they've had that content proofread. Uh, if somebody isn't taking the time to, uh, you know, really dot their T's and cross their I's, um, then maybe they are taking liberties elsewhere 
uh, with the quality of the information that they're sharing. Maybe they just don't care. Maybe they, I don't have time for grammar. I've got to, I've got to get the truth out. Um, well, everyone's got time for grammar, and you're not going to get the truth out any more accurately if your grammar sucks. Uh, so, you know, if the website is bad, maybe that's an indication that the content is also bad. Um, again, that's not, you know, I don't want to say it's like a total write off, but if I see a lot of spelling errors and stuff, like, I'm just like, you didn't even care to do spell checking. How am I supposed to take you seriously? Um, so uh, then purpose, the, the P in crap, uh, the reason the information exists, what's the purpose? And this is sort of shading into some areas that we'll get to a little bit more thoroughly with rhetorical analysis, but why is this information there, right? And, you know, did you get this information off of a business website? You know, information hosted on a business website, it might be factually correct, but its intention is to sell you stuff, right? Um, so they might not, you know, it might not be the best source of that information, or it might be sort of not highlighting the more negative aspects of something, uh, you know, depending on what their intention is, right? Is this, is this content to entertain? Uh, you know, oftentimes, you, you know, we talk about, you know, edutainment, uh, you know, to a certain extent, education can be entertaining. But if you're looking at something whose, you know, primary purpose is entertainment, maybe it's not as rigorous and thorough as it could be. Maybe it's uh, vaguer than it should be. Maybe it's overly reductive about stuff. Um, there's a lot of like cookie cutter content on YouTube that's like this. There's a, a channel that I generally like called Wisecrack that does like a lot of like soundbite cultural analysis. They're like, is you know, art is social media the the future of humanity or the death of humanity? And it's like they just find these ways of like sort of framing things in these very obvious false dichotomies. And then by the end of the or the uh, the video, it's like actually it's this middle way that I didn't talk about at the end, right? Um, I, I agree. It is clearly the death of humanity. Um, but uh, yeah, these little like, yeah, these, you know, if you've ever spent five minutes on Reddit, like every Reddit post is some version of this like kind of clickbaity, like the purpose is to get you to click on stuff. The purpose is to, you know, maybe, you know, interest you for five seconds and move on, right? Whereas, you know, Beckham's article is a really good example of that is information uh, whose purpose is to inform and persuade in an academic sense. That's why it's 12 pages long and it's kind of tedious in some parts. And it's not, you know, it drags a little bit. To be frank, some parts are kind of boring. But, you know, that's just the nature of it, right? Not everything, like, you know, just because it's not in, intended to entertain doesn't mean that it shouldn't, you know, it doesn't need to hold your attention in some other way. Um, is the opinion fact or is the information facts, opinions, or propaganda? Um, you know, Propaganda is, you know, it's got a really bad rap. It's a pretty inherently negative word nowadays. Uh, you know, advertise, you know, pro, I like to make this distinction. Propaganda is uh, when people try to sell you political ideas. Advertising is when people try to sell you products. They're the same thing though. They're selling, they're either selling ideas or they're selling products, right? Propaganda isn't inherently bad, right? Um, a lot of propaganda is inherently it is pretty bad. Uh, but the idea of propaganda is just like, it's just framing something in a absolutely positive or absolutely negative light, right? And it's sort of overly reductive. That's the problem with propaganda is that it's manipulative because it's reductive. Uh, it's not highlighting the negative space really at all. Um, I've got some examples of this whenever we look at uh, fallacies. Um, oh boy, do I love old timey cigarette ads. Uh, if you wanna see a source of some great propaganda, doctors pitching cigarettes in the 50s. Oh, it's fantastic, it's fantastic. Um, so, you know, are there any overt political, ideological or any other kind of biases that are showing through in this data, right? Um, you know, political, uh, George Orwell very famously said, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, broadly speaking, political speech is bad speech. And political is like the, the worst thing that's happening to language in our time. Um, you know, political writing is raft with uh, fallacious characterizations, bad lines of arguments, ideological biases, um, cultural stereotypes and presumptions. Um, some of these are more obvious than others. And part of why we're gonna spend so much time looking at fallacies is because I, you know, I think this is a, that's a good way to sort of get into this idea of bias uh, of various purpose. 
Uh, and so I told you uh, a little bit earlier about lateral, lateral versus vertical reading. Uh, when we read laterally, one leaves a website. You open up new tabs along a horizontal axis. So you use the resources of the internet to learn about a site and its claims. Um, whereas vertical reading, this is just top to bottom, staying on the same website, right? Staying in the silo, which, you know, there are benefits to reading vertically, right? There's a lot going on on a, uh, on a particular page that you can glean from that page. But, you know, moving away from it might give you a broader perspective on how this website fits into the larger discourse that's going on that you might not necessarily be able to get through the website. Maybe the website is existing in some kind of ideological silo that the only sources that it links you to are other sources that very conveniently confirm the point of views that are given on the website. They don't necessarily consider con, uh, you know, counter information or uh, address some kind of like sort of counter arguments uh, or at least plausible counter arguments. Um, there's a way of deploying uh, counter arguments against something in such a way that is like, you know, not productive to address <laughs> for sure. Uh, but we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, the Gish Gallup and sort of inherently negative debate strategy. Um, so uh, according to the MLA Guide to Digital Literacy, uh, Elaine C. Carrillo points out that just using the crap test while reading vertically can confine you to a website, which really works against your ability to evaluate its credibility. So like her, I will advocate reading both literal, uh, vertically and horizontally. Right, incorporating the resources of the internet to sort of fully evaluate things. Um, and so th these are some lateral reading resources. I've got links to all sides and factcheck.org in the uh, big folder of helpful links, but also add Fontis Media has a really useful media bias chart. And we, I think we all know, at least have heard of Snopes. Uh, add Fontis is pretty interesting. There's like an interactive media bias chart. Um, you can search this chart and you can zoom in on more or less uh, different parts of it, but it's sort of this broad spectrum of media sources, which is really interesting. So an interesting way of uh, representing this data and you can like sort of scroll over different parts and like you know, zoom in on more or less different things. There's different sort of axes and ways they've sliced this up. Um, and one of the things that all sides points out that I think is actually really useful to keep in mind is, you know, just because something is middle, you know, just because something doesn't have a particular left or right bias doesn't mean that that information is objective, right? It's not as if we're aiming to all be middle of the road, right? Um, there are certain things that, you know, it's kind of disingenuous actually to say that all issues have just two sides. Uh, some things have more than two sides. Um, you know, some issues maybe don't have sides. I don't know. Um, I'm not really interested in the two sides of the flat earth debate, for instance, um, especially when the flat earth side of the flat earth debate refuses to accept any evidence that would possibly undermine its uh, propositions which is you know, sort of where I'm getting at with uh, the, you know, the fallacy of suppressed evidence, the fallacy of moving the goalposts. You know, it doesn't matter what information you bring to a debate, somebody will always sort of bat, uh, you know, raise the bar of criteria. Um, you know, that's not productive. That's not doing anything useful. But um, you know, this gives you a pretty broad uh, view. And you know, there are different ways that you can criticize these kinds of media charts. It's not, you know, the final word on any of this, but it's a useful way to conceive of this information. And so that's linked in these notes here at the end. That's out uh, at Fontis Media. And then all sides is a little bit more of a text based. You enter in, you know, a source. They have a media chart that's very similar to at Fontis, but you can like search different sources and like it'll tell you a little bit about them. Not everything is on there because it is kind of user supported at that same time. Like users have to sort of, uh, it's almost like a Yelp of media evaluation in a way. Um, and, and it's, you know, not necessarily a nonprofit organization. They do have, you know, they, they do accept money from ad revenue. Um, so it's not totally objective, but it's a good place to start. Uh, all right. And so on that note, before I dive into MLA, I'll introduce the next two assignments for the research paper. Uh, so if you go to the research module, you'll see the crap analysis uh, and you'll see the research proposal. And 
These are due the same week, although the proposal is due on the 24th. It's not a particularly long essay. It's 400 words. It is a structured writing, like I said, so you have the ability to revise it. Um, the crap analysis I have due earlier that week, it's due on Tuesday, simply because it's just kind of filling out this worksheet, and it's not a particularly long worksheet. Uh, and I want you to fill out two different worksheets for two different sources. Um, so what you'll get when you click on the, the link that you'll see that's attached to it is this guy. Uh, so what you'll do is I want to know some biographical details about the source, right? Give me the name, uh, you know, who wrote it, the title, the source, and the URL. And maybe it's not, uh, maybe an individual didn't write it. Maybe more than one person wrote it. Maybe, you know, the CDC wrote it, right? A lot of government websites don't have specific authors. They have like staff writers and they'll say that this was written by the CDC or something like that. You go to historychannel.com, it'll say like history channel staff, right? They don't credit specific authors. Uh, so you know, some sense of like who wrote this thing, right? What person or organization produced it? And then uh, some crap answers, uh, some crap questions, right? Um, each one of these has a point value attached to it. Uh, and they're all pretty basic objective questions. Uh, some of them I will ask you to briefly explain if you choose other, right? Are the links functional, right? Maybe you clicked on a bunch of links, maybe some are and some are, right? You know, I wanna know about that, right? Uh, I clicked on, you know, most of the links, some of them worked, a couple of them didn't. I got some 404 errors, right? And, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? That's kind of all I'm looking for there. There's no like word count on these, just sort of, sufficiently explain why you're choosing the other answer instead of the yes or no. Um, and a couple of like general, like this one here is the purpose of the information, uh, choose all that apply, right? Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about its specific purpose. If it has some other purpose that maybe isn't stated here, you know, briefly explain like what is the purpose here? Is it a twin purpose of some kind? Um, is it, you know, is it some purpose that isn't listed under any of these? Uh, what was this? This question about relevance, would you be comfortable using this source, express any misgivings that you have, right? Just kind of, you know, explain how you feel about this. Do we provide links to the certain sites or are we able to do any site? Um, I don't know if I understand the either or because the first thing, uh, do we have Oh, do you have provided links? No, this is your original research for the topic that you wrote about in your free writing, right? I got a lot of like really strong sentiments in the free writings where you got you gave me a list which I liked, and then a lot of I would say most people started their free writing with I have chosen to like this topic, right? So now we're just now it's just pouring down into that topic, right? And like I said, I'll give you. Uh, you, I will, you know, up until you turn in your research proposal, I will allow you to switch topics, right? But what you submit for your proposal, that's going to be the topic that you're locked into. So if you choose to go in a different direction than you went in your free writing for both the crap analysis and the proposal, that's fine. But once you turn in that proposal, that's the topic you're locked into. Does that make sense? Um, you know, if you feel like you did that wrong, uh, we can circle back to that and we can talk about it a little bit at the end if you have some time, uh, or if, uh, if you don't have time, maybe we can talk via email. Um, Kat, you also feel like maybe you didn't? Yeah, I just feel like I didn't really, um, I just kind of focused on the free writing part of it not really like the researching part of it. So, oh, so that's what we're pivoting to. Right, I mean, like I this tried, is. But I didn't, I didn't. I wasn't sure if we were supposed to cite stuff. I guess, but. So in the free writing, no, you were not supposed to cite anything. Some people did. Um, how many URLs should we do the crap analysis? Uh, Rebecca, it's going to be two sources for those. So you're going to do two individual, like one website and then a, a set, two websites, right? So it's going to be, you know, the URL. You're going to have two URLs, right? Each each worksheet has a different URL. Uh, but to go back to what you were uh, expressing, Kat, there. Uh, all right, so we, we can talk about that, Abby. Um, what you're talking about is, you know, the free writing is just laying some groundwork for something that you would be interested in. And then, you know, if you decide you don't want to go in that direction for your research paper, you don't have to. Now is the time to, you know, decide 
you know what, that thing I wrote about my free writing, I'm not interested in that actually. I wanna go in a different direction. Maybe it's one of those things that you listed out. Maybe it's something that you haven't thought about yet at all, right? That was really to just get you thinking about what could I do a research paper on? And a lot, you know, like I said, people are more or less at different degrees of confidence about where they are. Some people were very, very strongly about, you know, this is the topic that I want to spend some time doing research on and finding information about in the next stage, right? So now we're in the stage of now I'm looking for you to find some information, look for some websites and, you know, evaluate uh, the truth for this. Is there a specific format you want us to do for our research assignments? I am about to get to that. Does that make sense, Kat? Yes. <laughs> okay. I was typing a whole thing, but yeah, I mean, okay. it's, yeah, cool. No, yeah, it's just uh, research by means of baby steps, right? So this is just the next step, right? And like I said, you have up until like once you submit that proposal, then that's then we're locked in. That's the topic that we're going to stick with. So this crap analysis, like I said, it's not too many questions. They're they're relatively straightforward. There's not a lot of like actual content production in the answering of these. Uh, so that's why uh, that one is going to be due next Tuesday. But then next Friday on the 24th, that's when you've got the uh, the proposal due. And so I'll go over the proposal now, and then we'll pivot from the proposal. We'll talk about MLA. Um, so what is the proposal? This is a 400 word minimum uh, essay. Uh, it is a composed a well organized and proofread proposal, which has a per uh, persuasive and referential purpose, which adheres to the principles of MLA style and outlines the topic you will address in your research project. This assignment will form the basis of your later annotated bibliography, the research draft and the presentation that you give at the end of the semester. So this proposal should build on one of the topics you discussed in the free write you brought to the meeting and the notes with, oh, which actually ignore that there was no meeting that was like left over from a, a former version of this assignment. I'll edit that out. Um, but the free writing that you did, uh, whenever I do face to face instruction, I have like a meeting where people come in and we like sit down and we have a little talk for like 10 to 15 minutes about like where I'm like, you tell me about your topic. Uh, and then we use the free writing as like a gauge. Uh, but it's a little bit hard to do distance wise. So that's just that's a remnant from a previous version. Um, but the notes uh, that I'm going to give you on your feedback, right, use that as a, like incorporate that right and like Kat was uh, expressing if you want to go in a different direction here's the time to do that is whenever you're composing this assignment. That's when you, uh, if you want to switch uh, topics now's the time to do it. Um, like I said, however, you may write your proposals on a different topic if you so desire once you submit your proposal, you may not change your topic so. Um, what am I looking for in this assignment? Uh, adhere to correct MLA style, and we'll go over that in just a moment. Uh, submit a document in a valid file format in this assignment. So I'm looking for you to actually compose your document as a Google Doc or as a Word Doc or something that you save from a word processing application uh, as a PDF. I'm not really looking for you to write this in the text submission area because I'm looking for you to format this document in a very particular way. Um, and compose at least 400 words in a well, uh, well organized words, uh, which exclude the preliminary bibliography. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, I'm looking for a four section paper. So this is the structure of your S of your proposal. Uh, I'm looking for paragraph one uh, to be an introduction to your topic. It states your research question and offers some kind of tentative thesis statement. Your your begin your tentative statement that answers your research question. Right? What should or should not be the case. Um, paragraph two is a brief paragraph that describes your research methods and sources. Paragraph three is a conclusion, uh, and so that those three paragraphs, <laughs> those three, those three paragraphs uh, form the core of your structure. Intro one body paragraph that talks about sources and methods and then a brief conclusion that sort of answers the question of so what why is it important um and again i think you'll find that 400 words is a generous place to start uh you could probably easily generate twice that amount of content but i'm looking for at least 400 words um and so i want your 400 words i want these three sections to total 400 words right if it's only 400 words, including your uh, bibliography, I'm not gonna give you all the points for it, right? Because your bibliography doesn't count for word content. It's just a list of your sources. Um, and the sources don't count on the word count. Uh, so what, what am I actually looking for in section one? Compose an intro paragraph designed to interest your reader in your topic and proposal by providing some sort of historical or cultural context. 
At the end of your introduction, include a tentative thesis to indicate to your reader that you are entering your project, looking at your topic through a critical and analytic lens. This is just a fancy way of saying that uh, you're engaging in analysis and you're engaging in like formal criticism and you're offering, a, you're, you're dissecting a problem and offering a solution to it, or you're dissecting a topic and you're addressing some element of that topic with uh, some kind of proposal, some kind of persuasive purpose, some kind of argument that addresses something. Uh, this thesis should clearly state your intentions using some, some sort of meta structural phrase. In this project, I will, or this project will investigate, right? Generally, I tell people to avoid this kind of writing, but for your research proposal, it's fine. Um, you know, this, this research draft will discuss, right? Get all of that kind of language out of your system in this paper. <laughs> um, so when we turn to your research, uh, your actual draft will purge that out of your vocabulary. But for the purposes of this, like I'm more, I am interested in your expressive purpose of the research. Um, so a good problem for this introduction is give me a little bit of context, right? Describe the problem. Uh, you know, describe some uh, context for your topic, then identify a problem, then move to your research question, then move to your thesis statement. And when we talk about essay structure, it's the introductions of all kinds have this kind of inverted pyramid structure. Start general and start whittling it down and getting more specific and more specific until your most specific statement, which is your thesis statement, which is the most specific thing that you're saying. It's the claim that you're making. It's the proposal, so it's the solution to some problem that you're addressing, right? It's the way that you're sort of uh, offering some kind of persuasive argumentative response to a question uh, that is orienting your research. Um, each stage in this formula should be a few sentences long, but your tentative thesis should be a single statement that captures your main claim and the primary reasons which support it. Um, research methods and sources. In this section, discuss the methods and sources you'll use to conduct your research. So in this, I want you to just kind of talk about where do you think that you're going to find some good research? Right. Talk about some academic databases that uh, I've introduced you to. Right. I'm going to look into the Gale research database uh, and I'm going to look under the following topics for information. Right. I'm also going to look at, you know, uh, these websites on the Internet seem like they might be useful. Right. And that's where your crap analysis kind of goes hand in hand with this, because some of those that groundwork that you're doing in your crap analysis is exactly what you're going to be talking about in your research and methods, right? You do talk, tell me a little bit about where you went to find that information or where else you can go to find information. If that information you did for your crap analysis is bad, tell me where you think you can find better information, right? The one thing I don't want to see is I went to Wikipedia and Wikipedia told me that I know all the information about this topic now. Wikipedia should not appear anywhere in any of this. Um, Again, if you start with Wikipedia, that's fine. Just don't end with Wikipedia and don't, don't name it. The ghost of Wikipedia may permeate the ideas in your paper, but don't say anything about Wikipedia, right? We, just, we don't talk about it. Um, use the sources of Wikipedia, right? Use your crap analysis on the Wikipedia articles and decide for yourselves if they're useful uh, to places to start, right? But just don't, don't use it as a source. Uh, and then your conclusion, Compose, uh, compose, uh, words are hard. Compose a short paragraph which addresses the question, so what? Why does your topic and position matter as more than an academic exercise? Why should your audience want to read it? Why does it matter? Why should people care? This is the tell me why it's important, right? The sell me paragraph, right? If I'm a marketing executive, like what's the big idea, right? Why do I care? Uh, I'll bring back my terrible mid-Atlantic accent. And then I want you to give me a preliminary bibliography. Um, titled preliminary bibliography uh, that just has two sources in it. And so this is an exercise to generate MLA uh, like sources like they would look at an MLA work cited. Uh, the only difference is I also kind of want you to include after each citation, give me a brief note of like where you found this. Like where, where'd you get this you know, website or whatever? Uh, where'd you find it? Is this out of an academic database? Did you get this out of the library stacks? Like wh what's going on here? Is this a book? Did you find it on the side of the road? Did a you know, a magical being emerged from your closet with some beans and like you grew out of that. Like, how did you find this information, right? If that happened, please tell me, I wanna know. Um, 
yeah, you can reference print books for sure. Uh, if you want to be like, I got this information out of a book on my shelf, that's fine. Uh, that briefly describes like where you got that information. Uh, you know, maybe give me some information about like when it was published, right? Is it pretty current? Is it timely? Uh, again, you know, no Wikipedia and your Wiki, uh, preliminary bibliography. Uh, does everybody sort of get what's going on here? Any questions, comments, or concerns? So we don't just have to use the um, ACC library databases. We can, like they said, or like they comment about books and. Yeah, other. you don't necessarily, if, if you want to use like other libraries, right? Like the Austin Public Library, the San Marcos Public Library, if that's okay. your, if that's your deal. Uh, if you want to, you know, if you're finding stuff on Google Scholar, you know, that's fine. You can use Google Scholar. Just kind of tell me, you know, where was that information contained, right? Google Scholar is going to give you links to information on websites on the internet. Like, tell me a little bit about what was that website? Where did it come from? How did you get to it, right? Okay. And there will be some, I'm, I think, in the ACC library, mm -hmm. um, the services for, like, citing those extra resources outside of their own databases, right? So, yeah, that's what we'll, I'll, I'll go over next is I'm going to talk about MLA. Uh, and we're going to talk about like what what are these sources supposed to look like? And um, so that I don't run out of time, I do want to call up a model real quick. Uh, this is a student paper, um, salicylic, sal salicylic, salicylic. I think it's salicylic. Salicylic acid is a chemical peel and its effects. Um, and this paper does uh, some things that are really good. It does some things that are, you know, I would not have done and I think could be done better, but it models some really good concepts, including the work side of page. So there's some formatting stuff that I think it's important to highlight. We've got our, our heading up here, which if you want more information about like actual document formatting, please see the formatting, doc basic document formatting tutorial video on my YouTube channel. It kind of goes over building this physical document. Uh, it's got a page number up here and the header. Uh, our heading is up here at the top of the page underneath the header. Please don't put your heading in this section. Uh, you'll know that any your heading is in this section if you see it on every page of your document. Um, Am I right? Your heading is up here in the top left-hand corner. It's got a title centered on its own line. It's got, you know, it's using paragraph indention, right? We're using the tab key to indent all of our paragraphs, uh, which, you know, not everybody uses the tab key to indent their paragraphs. And for instance, this student uh, decided to use the space bar a whole bunch of times. Uh, you know, it's not a great use of formatting. Uh, it doesn't preserve it across like different mediums. So when you upload it, it's going to ruin your formatting. Um, so, you know, using the tab key one time will indent your paragraphs nicely. Uh, using paragraph structure, right? You've got one inch margins on each side. We've got our content, it's called left aligned or left uh, justified, right? As opposed to being, you know, aligned to the right hand margin or aligned to the middle or even god forbid justified which makes it flush on both sides but makes your content look super wonky um no, we want the left uh and we want to go with the one in tab key um but one thing i want to show you is what this student does with their work cited page which after the end of your document uh on the following page, you'll see a work cited page. And so you can see this uh, student had two sources in their uh, essay. One was the Mayo Clinic. Uh, they used this, the page Chemical Peel. Uh, this was when it was published. This was the URL. Uh, they also used uh, a, something from a, like a formal journal of some kind, Clinical Cosmetic and Investigational Dermatology. Um, uh, the author was Arif Taslim. Uh, and it was as specific as you can get about this topic. Uh, and it was from the NCBI database, the national, um, oh, I can't remember what NCBI stands for uh, in particular, but it's a, what, it's a medical database maintained by the CDC uh, and the National Institute of Health. Um, but you can kind of see what, like, this is kind of what's going on here. With citation and what I want to do when I talk about MLA style uh, right now is talk about each of these individual elements, where to find them, how to organize them, and that's really the upshot. So this is like one part of MLA style is building. Uh, you know, in this case, in your final draft, you're going to call it work cited, right? In your proposal, you'll call this preliminary 
uh, bibliography. All right, you can see my terrible spelling. Um, you know, you'll call it that because that's what it is in your proposal. But for your final draft, it'll be your work cited because these are the works that are cited in your paper, right? If you if you're not citing something, if you're not borrowing, oh, National Center for Biotechnological Information. Thank you, Mike. Um, it's a mouthful. Um, you know, if you're not citing something specifically, either through direct quotation or paraphrase, it should not appear in your work cited, right? So if you just read something and it was interesting, but you couldn't really incorporate it specifically, it's not going to go in your work cited. APA deals with things a little bit differently. They have bibliographies in APA. So even if you didn't necessarily cite it, you might still include it in a bibliography, but for an MLA works cited page, if it's not cited, then it's, it doesn't appear. And the citations are like this. Right. So, uh, for instance, this statement right here, uh, the superficial peel, quote, removes the outer layer of skin, epidermis, to treat fine wrinkles, acne, uneven skin tone and dryness. And this is the second element of MLA style. This part, they're called the in-text citation. Right. And it tells me that if I want to find out where this quote came from, this quote came from the source that starts chemical peel. So I can scroll down to their work cited page. I can say, ah. It's this source right here, it's chemical peel. I can go to this URL, I can find that specific language, right? And it's creating, it's sort of the Hansel and Gretel theory of building uh, credibility in academic writing, right? I can find all the information that you're sourcing and I can follow your train of thought. I can build on that. I can follow up on this. I can check the veracity of the information. It's the idea that it, you know it's accountability being sort of baked into the uh, idea of you know, doing academic writing. Um, and this is really important. This only has two sources. Some academic papers get incredibly complicated. I wrote, you know, I wrote papers by the time I graduated, you know, the last paper I wrote, I think had 15 to 20 sources. And that's like not even publication quality stuff. Like the books that you read, the nonfiction books that are published often have, you know, pages and pages. Uh, like there, there are works cited pages and bibliographies that are longer than anything you will ever write put together. <laughs> um, they get very long. Uh, these people do a lot of research. Um, and so this is this forms like a basis for all of that, though, right? All of the what comes after this, all of this, like the writing you produce, the further in academia you go, is really like builds on this idea. And so we're definitely not going to get to fun uh, some structure stuff today, but I'll give you a brief introduction to academic styles. Um, there's three main styles. I'm going to talk about MLA, and I've got links to all these different uh, styles. APA, like I said, is the one that you're going to use most. I doubt you'll really encounter Chicago or Turabian is just kind of more of a way of doing Chicago. Uh, but APA is the one that we're going to be talking about. There's a lot more styles than this, uh, but this is the one that, especially like legal writing has a lot of their own styles. Uh, but it, familiarity with the principles of one is going to make it, the others more uh, intelligible and understandable. Uh, so we're governed by the MLA, uh, which is the Modern Language Association. It's an organization uh, which it's sort of an advocacy group. It's part research institution, part advocacy group, part like setting standards for uh, documenting information in the humanities. Uh, they publish an academic journal called PMLA. Um, and you know this, they've been around for you know since 1883. They're the, the oldest surviving uh, language-specific organization. Uh, so a system of documentation directs readers to a source of a quotation, a paraphrased idea, a fact, or other borrowed material. References are formatted in a standard way so that they can be quickly understood by all, just like a common language. A documentation system thus gives writers a comprehensible, verifiable means of referring to one another's work. And it also allows writers to seek out relevant publications in the course of their research so that they can learn from and build on the work of others. By giving credit to the precursors whose ideas they work with, scholars allow future researchers interested in the history of a conversation to trace the line of inquiry back to its beginning. So that's one of the main, or a variety of the main aims of documentation. And it's also to sort of head off the idea of plagiarism. Um, which is defined as presenting another's ideas, words, or an entire work as your own. Um, and you know, all of you, or at least most of you, uh, completed the plagiarism tutorial. Uh, and you should be aware that you know plagiarism isn't necessarily intentional, right? Uh, plagiarism, another way of saying plagiarism, is saying uh, inaccurately cited uh, or not cited, right? If you bar, let's say, you know, if I'm looking at this student's writing. And oh, let's look at this model. 
um, you know, let's say this student in this quote right here didn't include this citation, right? And just had put that. Right. Well, where does that borrowed language come from? Well, I don't know. I have no way of figuring out where to source this. Right. Strictly speaking, that's plagiarism. Right. I mean, it, again, it's not something I'm, I'm not going to call the, you know, the English department police on you for it. But it's, you know, the, it's not necessarily plagiarism is not necessarily about intent. Right. It's not that, oh, I bought this paper from somebody or I copied and pasted something and didn't put quotations around it, although that's part of it. Uh, some of it is just like maybe not citing it correctly, um, you know, or, you know, maybe putting the wrong citation in here, too, if I were to put chemical peel. You know, and then I go to the chemical peel source and this information isn't in the chemical peel source. Now we're plagiarizing because we're not quote, we're, not, we're not citing stuff appropriately. And that's really what the aim of MLA style or any real academic style is aiming to capture is this idea that we're just trying to make people accountable for the language that they're borrowing from other places. Um, and there's a couple of instances where we'll talk about some marginal cases, probably not today. Uh, I'll definitely come back to these ideas and we'll sit with these for the rest of the semester. But um, I, I introduced this idea of in-text citation as a brief unobtrusive reference that directs readers to the work cited list entries for the sources you consulted and were relevant to the location of the source being cited. Um, and like I said, it's, it's usually the author's name. Again, there's a lot of marginal cases where sometimes there's a, you know, a website doesn't have a specific author. Uh, maybe it's a staff writer or like an, an institution. Uh, the MLA handbook, for instance, is written by the MLA itself, right? There's no author of this book. It's the Organization of the Modern Language Association is the author. Uh, government reports, right? They're authored by the United States, technically speaking. Um, so like, you know, if you're citing a law, if you're citing like the contents of like, I don't know, uh, census data or something like that, right? Those are like sourced to the government itself, right? Now, it, it, no one individual produced that data. It's the, the product of lots of people working in concert. And there's a way of dealing with corporate authors or anonymous works, but nine times out of 10, you're dealing with specific people writing specific things. Um, and then uh, the works cited page is an alphabetical list of all those sources paraphrased or directly quoted in the body of your draft. Um, and that's really important too, is why we organize these sources the way that we do is that they're organized alphabetically, right? It's organized alphabetically by whatever shows up here, right? If it's an author, it's easy. You alphabetize them by their, you write their last name first, followed by a comma, and then their first name. Uh, if not, if it's just the title, and then it's gonna be alphabetized by the title, right? And these can get more or less complicated. For instance, this student has a uh, pretty, this student has not effectively alphabetized, right? This this source needs to become before this source, right? So this student actually, you know, the actual content of the citation, like these are built really well. They're just not alphabetized, right? So they need to be, they, they should go back and alphabetize these sources. I think is this model here, the model three has a boatload of sources. Uh, this is four sources, um, but uh, it looks like this one down here, fair check, that one isn't uh, alphabetized correctly. We need to move that one, uh, B, C, F. We need to put it right there. Um, and you should also notice one other weird formatting thing. What other weird formatting thing do you, that jumps out to you about these sources? Just like the way that they look as compared to like a normal paragraph, right? looks like the first line is not indented and the rest of the lines are. That is absolutely correct. Uh, this is <laughs> this is called hanging indention and nobody knows how to do it at all. And that's absolutely fine. Uh, nobody teaches anyone how to do hanging indention. They just leave you on your own to figure it out. It took me years to find out that this is a format that you apply in uh, you can apply it in Microsoft Word. You can apply it in Google Docs. But basically what it is, is let's say you know, for the sake of argument, I unapply hanging indention. And I've got all of my sources. And this is kind of what my sources look like. It's this chaotic mess of information. Like you highlight information, 
like whatever you want to be indented with hanging indention. And it means exactly what Deborah said. That's a great definition. It hangs the first line of your source on the margin and indents every other line of your source information. Um, and there's a couple of different ways you could do it. You could right click on it and go to paragraph styles. Um, then in the indention under special, there's a little drop down menu and you can click hanging and it'll just automatically do it for you. If you're a little bit more like, I, I can, you know, mess with the sliders. Is it this top one now? The top one is there. Was it the bottom one? No, that's not the bottom one. It's got to be the third slider. No. Okay. Yeah. So you would slide it over and then you would take the top slider back out. That's real complicated. I don't know why anybody would do, do that. It's very similar to Google Docs, right? And actually, if, uh, if I were to call up a Google Doc, which I should have already been signed in, now you've got now I've got to go through the whole sign-in process. You can see all my different uh, personas, and I'm going to have to do two-step verification. <laughs> Uh, but it's arguably like easier to do in Google Docs. Like Microsoft Word is a little bit overpowered for a lot of the writing we do. There's a lot of options. Google Docs is like pretty stripped down. Um, but basically anything you can do in Microsoft Word, you can do simpler in Google Docs. Um, but let's say I just have this blank document and like I, let's just, let's use this one. Just copy paste it there. Okay, I don't need any of that. Right, so I've got my sources here. I can highlight them. And again, I can right click. And is there a paragraph formatting here? It looks like I can't do it from right click. So, so I could actually, I could do it with the sliders. Again, I could go over an inch and then back a half inch. Um, or I could do it with like, if you have it all highlighted, you go to format. Uh, paragraph styles, options. Oh, no, it's not under options. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Line spacing paragraph. Um, custom spacing, add page break. Where did they put all the stuff? Borders and shading. Reset styles? No, that's not it. Huh, I'm gonna have to nose around in uh, Google Docs. If anybody knows how to do it in Google Docs, there's definitely uh, tutorials for it, but it used to be I would go to format and under paragraph styles, it would be under options, but it looks like it's moved or they've moved it around. Is it maybe that um, those two little icons on the top right, like, almost all the way those last those next two these over no over to the right the right the right those two oh these two these are these are just indentions right so like i could take whole blocks of text and i can indent it in uh and then i could i could grab that and pull it out it's like that yeah, yeah it's a workaround like that's a one way you can do it oh hey come back um yeah, I'll, I'll do a little bit more investigation than this. It used to be under formatting and paragraph styles. I don't know why or where they've moved it to. Um, paragraph padding. So, yeah, I don't know. That's weird. Um, but there is a way to do it in Google Docs that, like I said, I mean, that's one way you can do it is you can just like pull the, uh, you know, click and hold the down arrow slider, bring it in an inch, click and hold just the little top of the rectangle slider pull it back over a half inch where's my half inch there it is uh to hang it on the margin it's the same result um but there is one there is a, a, a quicker clicky way to do that um and there are some mla resources uh we weren't gonna have terribly a lot of time to go over these we'll go over this a little more in depth on thursday and i'll really bore down into like how do you build a citation? Like, how do you, what information do you keep track of? Um, it's a lot of the stuff that you're going to find in the crap test. It's just how do you organize it the way that the MLA wants it, right? Um, and you can kind of see that information playing out here, right? We, we want the author, right? We want what's called the title of the source, right? Which is the most immediate uh, text you're looking at. We want something called the container, 
in what is this source contained, right? Is it a page on a website? Is it a, a song on an album? Is it a, uh, an episode of a television show, right? And we'll talk a little bit about the distinction between sources and containers. We have a publication date, right? Uh, that for this container is published uh, July, 2020. Some sources have extra information to keep track of called the number and the version. Uh, academic journals are these things. Most things don't have numbers and versions. Print books have different editions. That's the information that would go in this place if it's a print book. Generally speaking, most sources end up looking like, especially if you're using just web page sources, most stuff ends up looking like this page right here. Um, sometimes you'll have like a, an author before this. Um, but this is what almost every website is going to end up looking like. If you like, if you're using, you know, an article from the New York Times, if you're using uh, a page from the CDC website about, uh, you know, acne, um, a lot of them are just going to be author name, title of your source, what website did you get it from, when was it published, what URL is it, right? That's practically speaking how you're going to deal with most things. Um, like I said, there is a lot of nuance to deal with because the MLA has to be pretty flexible about the kind of stuff that you can cite. For instance, you can cite a comment on a YouTube video. You can cite a tweet. You can somehow cite a Snapchat. Um, there's all different kinds of media that you can cite. Uh, you can cite a, a, an actor's particular performance in a movie. You can cite a physical object on display in a museum. Um, you can cite a lot of different stuff. So the MLA is like sort of the provisions for building these citations are pretty flexible. Uh, and not all of the things that you like, there's some sources have less information than you can possibly keep track of. Uh, so for instance, like since the websites don't have versions and numbers, you don't really keep track of those for a website. Um, you really just want what's the title of the website, you know, what's the publication date, what's the URL, who wrote it, right? That's really all the stuff that you're keeping track of there. But like for a TV show, you know, you might want to name the director. You might want to name like any other editors that were involved. Like if you're talking about the cinematography or something, uh, that's probably way more information than we require, right? Y'all are probably just going to be dealing mostly with, you know, articles in academic journals, pages of websites, maybe some YouTube videos, possibly some print books. Um, and those are all relatively easy and relatively similar. Uh, and so we'll we'll get into the specifics of those a little bit more next time. So this is just kind of a dipping your toe into and welcoming uh, you to MLA style. Uh, and I'll go over these example essays uh, about some of the things that these students are doing uh, well and not so well in terms of structure next time. Uh, but that is a pretty good place for us to stop. So we'll get to this next time, Fundamentals of Writing. We'll talk about some essay writing concepts, um, structure ideas for writing introductions and conclusions, uh, incorporating quotes using transitions, uh, the pie paragraph model of uh, essay structure, uh, writing topic sentences, and all sorts of that good stuff. And then I'll go into a little bit more elaboration about MLA stuff, but I'll go ahead and close all that down. I'll stop our share and I'll kill our recording for today.